everyone. I'm Kelly. I'm a product marketer at Atlassian and an agile enthusiast. I had the opportunity to chat with industry leaders about the evolution of estimation agile, specifically about the controversial topic of story points, where they came from, what are they, how have they been misused, and are they still a valuable tool for teams? Story points are a unit of measure for expressing an estimate of the overall effort that will be required to fully implement a product backlog item or any other piece of work. So teams assign a unit of measure to each piece of work relative to things like the complexity of work, the amount of work to do, and any risk or uncertainty. So why do they do this? So they need to be able to break down work into smaller pieces so they can really address that uncertainty. This helps build consensus and commitment to the solution. And over time, this helps teams understand how much they can achieve in a period of time and really helps them over longer term to really see how they're improving and how they're delivering value. So where did this come from? Where did story points come from? So what I know where story points come from, I believe they are generally uh, uh, credited to XP or extreme programming, but really um, they became um, a way to more reliably predict when software could be delivered. I know that's really hard to do and we could talk about that, but estimation using story points really was an answer of how to um, solve for that a little bit better, I guess, than time estimation. So it then became a really popular tool for agile teams. And it's really why we're here today. It's been a, they've been around for a long time and there's uh, people that see kind of both sides of it. thing that would ha that happen with stories story points is not that they themselves went wrong that's like saying where did miles go wrong um you know miles didn't go wrong it's just you know kilometers are better but miles didn't go wrong it's just how people use them and so we have management that wants to do things like compare teams um and we can't really do that with story points um and we have a lot of misinformation out there about what a story point is um where we'll have teams that just say you know a story point equals eight hours. And if you're going to define a story point at eight hours, why go through the hassle of calling it a story point, just call them eight hours or calm days or something. Um, and we have other teams that'll make a similar mistake and just say they're just complexity. And as you went through story points are not just one thing. They're a combination of factors. like how much of work, how much of the work there is to do, how complex, absolutely a factor, but also things like risk and uncertainty. So we kind of swirl all of those together and come up with an overall estimate of effort, but teams don't don't always understand that and they misuse them as just a renamed person days or um, a proxy for complexity and they'll even rename them complexity points at that case right um dave yeah it, it's interesting because obviously everybody wants predictable process everybody wants to know what they can get what when they can get it um, and obviously if you're building a, a complex product with lots of teams working together and there's product marketing and all these people involved then surely you need some idea of when all these things are going to appear and and story points uh, to re-echo Mike's point, it provide a really good mechanism for a team to do some sort of relative sizing, to do some comparison. The ideal man day or person day um, is, is an interesting concept and a, and a mechanism for that. Now, what's interesting also is that Scrum has been generally associated with story points and people think they're you know, you've got to use story points if you're using Scrum. That's not true. You know, if you go on Mike's classes or any of our classes, you, they'll say no. However, you do need to do sprint planning and you do probably need to do refinement, though it's obviously optional in the Scrum guide. So you do need to have some techniques and, and for, for doing that. And, and as you, you know, ultimately, as you measure things, you sort of, you, you, you have to have some mechanism for the team to learn and improve and get better at it. So you must make things transparent. One of the other thing that's, that, that I tend to see it going horribly wrong. So it might mention that when managers get it, they use it to compare across teams and, and those sort of ideas. The, the other thing is that, that really goes horribly wrong with it is when it's absolute, right? When it's like, that is the number and we can never improve it. We can never. And then you are then hit on the head if you get it wrong. Now, I don't know if you've ever had any, any work around your house, but experience would indicate that estimates are estimates. Or you ever watch the weather 
that's always great. And, you know, being from England, the weather or Troy, you're obviously Seattle, so you're used to it as well. Weird weather happens, you know, it's always wrong, right? So ultimately, I think that it goes wrong when people misuse the, the stuff, when they, when they try to compare teams, when they try to use it to judge how productive a team is, velocity. You know, velocity is great as an internal mechanism, horrible as an external mechanism. And also it should always be velocity of value, not velocity of work, right? I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the crux. So I think it's... Um, I think it sort of got off track when I hate to say this because managers are lovely. You know, I, I've, I've got a couple around my home. Everybody should get one. But the it's when managers and executives saw a mechanism for using it to start judging people. What do you think, um, Troy? Well, you know, I I was coding in an era before story points where we, you think you're setting a commitment in story points, wait till you're estimating in hours, you're setting a commitment <laughs> in hours. <laughs> and uh, I think story points gave us for the first time a chance in the XP days there of actually at least taking into account some system factors. In other words, one hour of dev time does not equal one hour of delivery time. You know, we've, we've got to plan for it and do it and stuff like that. So. Uh, at the time, they felt like a really positive aspect of a way of explaining to people that one hour of dev time did not equal one hour of delivery time uh, because there's 10 things in front of it and this one's sitting in a queue, yeah. right? And I think we sort of drifted away from that a little bit. So, you know, I see people whining and complaining about them now, but I wish back in my day, get off my <laughs> lawn, uh, they, 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 there was worse. Um, but I do think that, yes, at a team level, we need the team to be able to set capacity and they're the, probably the right tool for the job. At a, if I zoom out and I want to be that manager trying to understand how many people I need and how long a big project's going to take, um, they're not the droids we're looking for because they, uh, there's a lot of factors which cause time to elapse, which have nothing to do with the size and effort of the work. And I don't think points articulate that clearly. So I, I, I like them and don't like them. John, how about you from a product perspective? Well, you know, take this from a design perspective too. And I, I keep thinking about the single responsibility principle. <laughs> and I think that with a lot of things that, that appear organically as an experiment, I mean, I, I could just imagine being, a, I mean, I'm, I wasn't on that team involved when story points were coming up, but I could just imagine being with a group of people and saying, you know, we need to think of something to solve this problem. And we would come up with an experiment and the points sounded like a good way to do it. And, and it's perfectly fine. But I think that what you see is with a lot of these tools over time is that we, we, and I think this has been a thread throughout all of our responses is that you start to see more and more layered on top of the thing. It's just like layering things on top of a, of a service that you write or some part of your architecture, or some, some design or some object you have is that we're, you know, to use a jobs to be done idea, we're hiring um, points to do so many jobs. And I've done exercises with teams asking, what jobs do you hire story points for? And they don't stop at five jobs or eight jobs or 10 jobs or 15 jobs. There's literally sort of 20 jobs that then we group together in maybe six to eight jobs um, in that activity. So I, I, don't, I don't think I have much to add except for that as a theme that I've noticed in what everyone's mentioned is that I, I think that this is sort of a natural ebb and flow that you get something that, that emerges organically with how teams work and then their, their usefulness doesn't degrade. And, and then it becomes this constant debate of, well, you're doing it wrong. Well, you're not doing it like we used to do it. Yet at the same time, like with a lot of designed things or accidentally designed things, we begin layering on top of them, you know, uses and jobs and uses and jobs and misunderstanding. So I think that's where I, I don't think there's anyone sort of solely responsible for it. And I don't think there's a deep, dark empire sort of abusing <laughs> these things or do anything, but I just think this is, it's I, I in, in some workshops, I call it the way of ways. It's just what happens to things that worked at some point, And then people overload with all sorts of other jobs. And then eventually we forget what we're hiring them for. Um, so that's sort of how I see it. 
I, I love what you're saying there, John, because I feel like, you know, I work with marketing teams to do this and it's almost like story points have been, are still uncorrupted um, in, in that particular environment because they haven't been there all that long. And, and we are still, like you were saying, Troy, what we were doing before was much, much worse, which was trying to do hours or, or days or weeks or whatever. This will be done in three weeks. No way it will be done. <laughs> like I can guarantee you that is wrong. Um, and so the story points help to solve some of that, that early pain that you were talking about, but where I think it helps marketing teams in particular is partially around the predictable delivery, but also around the, the capacity and the realistic workload, right? So once you have that historical perspective on, we can do X number of points within a certain amount of time, and people begin to bring you hugely more point asks, you can say, no, I have a data-driven reason why that is highly unlikely to be achieved in the next two weeks, four weeks, what have you. And, and to be able to, to give them a tool with which to push back, I think is almost the best use case for story points in, in those kinds of um, environments. And then, you know, predictability is a bit of a bonus. Um, I'm totally stealing what you were talking about, John, about having too many jobs that we're asking points to do for us. Cause I think that that's an amazing watch out for, for teams that are new with this, which is most marketing teams, but it's, it's enormously powerful as you've all pointed out when done properly. Andrea, I'm going to chime in after what you said, um, our team that our teams that we were working with at my last role did everything time-based everything every job or piece of work put in had an estimate associated to it based on an average that it took someone to potentially do it the year before and so we would schedule everything like that and um, i'll be talking about this in a in our team tour coming up but we scheduled things months and weeks in advance based on that time no matter if it was you know designer a versus designer b Whatever the complexity of that was, it didn't matter. And those schedules would change 90 times a day, which just shows that the effort that we put in was not really doing anything because as soon as that date changed, it was a ripple effect. And so when you, when you think you're using those for, for good reasons, are you really, are you doing anything with that information? Um, our answer was no. So we stopped, stopped tracking time and trying to estimate it in that way. Cause it wasn't making sense. It was one factor and it did not, um, it was not taking into account the complexity and the dependencies and a lot of the things that really go into, you know, how long is it going to take me to do this thing that is solving this problem for, for whom? Um, great. Um, so cool. We said, we talked about a lot of things and we definitely have, um, some time, I think two really interesting things that came up were about, um, one of the main reasons for misuse. It sounds like there's potentially a, a disconnect between how teams are using story points and the value to teams versus the value that management wants to get out of those. So, um, does anyone want to chime in? I think it was Dave and Mike, you, you guys might've brought that up the most. And Andrew, I know you talk about it from an agency standpoint when you're trying to deliver to a customer, um, which is your stakeholders as well. Well, for me, it gets a little back to what John was describing. We just, and I, again, loved it, John, with the, the jobs to be done with for points. I always coach teams that points are good for two things. And John, you've got 18, so maybe I'm missing a few. Um, but the two that I tell teams that they're good for is answering questions about when will we be done or how much can I deliver by X date, right? So predicting the future. And they also help product owners prioritize. Mm -hmm. If I tell a product owner something's going to take a million points, the product owner probably doesn't want it. There's a lot we could do with a million points instead. If I tell the product owner it's going to be 10 points, they probably say, yeah, great. Let's, you know, let's keep it next sprint. We'll do it. And then if I tell the product owner it's a millionth of a point, I would never do that. But, you know, this is a millionth of a point. They'll probably say, wow, well, let's do it this afternoon then, right? Because it's so small. So knowing the number of points is very much a proxy for the cost of things. And it does help product owners prioritize because we want to be thinking about the value and the cost. And it lets us make predictions. But those are the only two two reasons. And as a guy who's written a lot about estimating, I feel like I spend a lot of my time talking teams out of estimating in certain cases, right? If you're not going to make a decision using the estimate, don't waste the time coming up with the estimate, right? It's not necessary. So, so Mike, what do you say to managers that want to do comparison, comparisons, 
between teams or used it to judge the the bonus or the promotion that we're going to give a team because how do we know how good the team was <laughs> i mean what would you say that i know what i would say but i'd be interested in your response well, you might like mine, Dave. What I normally tell them is to give me the bonus and I'll figure it out um, because it's not very hard to do. Um, go spend time with the team. I've never, I've never spent time with a team and wondered, are they any good, right? Um, it's just so easy to to game story points. I mean, it is easy to game person days before. Oh, so yeah. um, it's just not a useful measure. And most managers truly get it. And you talk about how, you know, managers are, are nice people, have one around your house, but they get it, right? They get it, but they're looking for what they can do instead. And I don't think we're ever going to get to the one magic metric that we can use for measuring um, team productivity. It's just not going to happen. And I don't think anything replaces spending time with the team. And I actually don't care. I actually like team. I don't mind if a team's lazy and doesn't do, is not very productive <laughs> if they're delivering loads of value. You know, I used to work with a geezer. He did the Times, uh, no, the Guardian crossword every day and smoke a pipe in the office. Remember those days? <laughs> and I, he didn't, I, he was the least productive guy. He was asleep for half the day, it looked like. And then he'd come and he'd start writing assembler and he'd mm -hmm. write for two hours. And literally he would, he was brilliant because the outcomes were awesome because of that. So I think the, that sort of holy industrial idea of make sure the workers are being busy needs to be replaced. And obviously that's exactly the same message that, that you give as well. And the story points and velocity are not great mechanisms to, you know, to make sure your workers are still working hard. Cause it doesn't matter if you, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Mike. No, go ahead. Andrew. I was going to say, it doesn't matter if you exert that effort, like you're saying, in two hours of concentrated, focused activity, or if you spread it out in fits and starts because you had to go answer Slack messages all day long, <laughs> right? That took you eight hours, but you expended the same amount of effort as if you just sat there for two hours and did it. Or do the crossword in the or case. Or do the crossword, of whatever you need to do. Particular gentleman. <laughs> but, I was thinking my favorite quote from the last year is, we know things are going well when we spend longer <laughs> on it. And this is, and I think this is all has to do with resolution of work. Like if we assume that teams are story, a story factory, a feature factory, then the output of those stories are what's there. But when the team told that to me is they said, well, when our work has impact, people continue to give us money and we get to keep working on the mission. Yeah. And so I always, you know, I, as a product person, I'm not worried about the one to three hour, one to three. I, 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 I estimate one to threes. It's either one to three hours, one to three days, one to three weeks, one to three months, one to three quarters, one to three years, one to three decades. Uh, any company is some, some graph of those particular things. And so when a team is working on a one to three quarter mission and it looks hopeful and we're funding them incrementally and, and, and say, you can keep going. I actually am happy. So that kind of blows all the lead time, cycle time, all those other metrics out of the water because it means that when you, if you go up to the right resolution of work, duration, a shorter duration might actually indicate that you're not doing as well. Um, so I don't know how, how that impacts people, but that's my product angle. We know it's working and we know our feet, we know we're learning as fast as we ship when we're actually able to continue working on something. We know we're not learning as fast as we ship when we're asked to move on to the next thing because no one has any feedback on what we're doing. So I know that's a pretty product centric way to think about it, but that's where my head's at uh, for this. I've read your one to three article, John, and it was great. I do something very similar and it gets us out of having to spend too much time. What I'll do is I'll ask a, a team, if I describe this feature to you or when I do, what number pops into your mind? Hour, and is it in hours, days, weeks, months, or years? <laughs> I don't care what the number is. And I know that days and weeks overlap, but if I say, Hey, how, you know, are you, if I ask you for an estimate, what are you thinking of? And they're like, in weeks. I'm like, good enough, right? Yeah. That, that is often enough for me to, to know where to prioritize it or where to, um, you know, how long we have to schedule for something. So, yeah. Um, you know, yeah, I'm thinking days, 8,000 days, right? I mean, yes, there can be anomalies there, but often that unit that pops into somebody's mind just instantly seems good enough for a lot of decisions. 
and, and then that gives you the opportunity because if it's months but the value is only days if you understand what i mean you know yeah. then it's like well what could we do that sort of cut the suit to suit the cloth conversation mm -hmm. is so valuable and, and it can be story points that drive that you know or it could be anything really but that mm -hmm. conversation, because then, particularly if the teams are aligned to business outcomes, John, which is exactly the thing they should be, they'll go, yeah, you know what we could do? We could do this and this, which is significantly different in terms of the workload than if we did this or this. And you're like, well, that wouldn't get that, but it would get this bit, and that's all that we care about, right? And let's try it. Let's get it in front of the customer. Oh, the customer's got great feedback, and the cycle continues. What I fear is that... Um when we actually moved to Agile and we went down that great product route there of outcome driven sort of, we never changed the way we funded projects or people. So we still had that one yearly sort of cost where management is looking for a way to put people hours so they can fund an amount of staff that you have. So I see a lot of those sort of jobs that we have thrown at points as being that we took away their ability to sort of plan and fund uh, annual budgeting and so forth. So I think until we address how we fund agile teams and products, uh, I think that we'll keep misusing points in that way. So, so I love what you're doing, John. I just think that we need to give our executives alternative ways of funding agile teams. The key is that incremental funding. Yeah, yeah, I would I would yeah. agree that if you're not funding that incremental funding, that that sort of throws everything off. I would I would concur. And it's not just that; it's also incentives as well. Outside, yeah, I think funding and incentives fundamentally, and and risk those three elements, right? They're the the three the three magic things of management: uh, funding, <laughs> risk, and incentives. Um, those three things, if they totally are aligned to the team's success and then you could be using anything and you're still going to have a nightmare they just happen to be a nightmare with story points because most people are using them thanks to the work of mike and, and others um i think that's the reality great um so i think we can go on this tangent forever and talk about this just from <laughs> me reading about you guys and i know the direction we can go and you talk about just agile in general and business agility and um organizational so let's move on to topic two, which is more of um, anti-patterns um, how, and how teams make their way back. And so um, just to tee up, I know you guys um, have some direction you want to go, but I'd like to cover some of the most common ways you've seen estimations go wrong, not to harp on it, but just so if someone is out there, they can say, oh, okay, this is something that I should be focused on. And then start talking about ways that they get there and ways that they can really turn themselves around or refocus to get back on track. So um, Dave, we can start with you. you yeah. Like so, I mean, ultimately wrong people, wrong time with the wrong information used to make the wrong decisions, right? So the that classic wrong, wrong, wrong. And I think I've stolen this from a thought worker that said it in a conference. I was like, oh, I must remember that. And Accidentally, I remembered it just that one moment. So, you know, the, the ultimately the, the wrong people, meaning that, uh, you know, the, what's the estimate? Come on, give it to me now. Fill in the JIRA ticket, you know, get it, get it, the, the JIRA issue, get it in without actually talking to the team, spending time, you know, those things, huge mistake then, you know, and then suddenly it becomes in gold because it's in JIRA and that is the that's the place, right? Nobody can change it. And so suddenly then that becomes the thing. And then, you know, that, that happens horribly and it happens frequently. Also, the, uh, the other anti-pattern is when estimates don't change, when they people don't have that chance to refine them and go back to them and say, hang on a minute, I just realized something. You know, we've been going down and not have that. And, oh, my God, it could be good. It doesn't always have to be bad. Usually it is bad. But the um, updating that, that, that is a huge implication. And, and then, you know, that incentive conversation. If you are going to – it's like when – when IBM decided, or I shouldn't probably say they're IBM, but IBM decided <laughs> to pay bonuses on lines of code, I'm going to make myself a minivan. So if you measure people on velocity, and st then you're not a rocket scientist, but I'm going to be like Scotty from Star Trek. You know, you notice that Scotty, Captain Kirk would always ask him, how long is it going to get before we get the engines back online? And he'd say, oh, it's destroyed. It will take, you know, 10, 20 hours. And he'd always come in under budget. 
Did you notice that? <laughs> It'd always come in before. If I was Kirk, I would have given him a slap because then Kirk is like trying to do all sorts of crazy ass things, you know, with his phasers and everything. And then what that resulted in was it a mess. So sandbagging, those sort of behaviors, think about the incentive model. And if it's tied in any way to the estimates, then you're going to be complete. That's a huge anti-pattern. Disconnect it completely, you know, and then maybe you have a chance, get the right people in the room. Then maybe you get the right, get a chance, except that they're not going to be right and they can change. Then you might get a chance. You know, those sort of things are the things that I see. John, you started talking about too many jobs for story points. Um, is that something that you consider to be an anti-pattern? Would like to elaborate on a little yeah, bit? I think that that's more sort of a meta anti-pattern. That that just happens anytime you're you're mulling something over for twenty plus years. I think to do it, but I mean, I think that the things the things that I see with teams, well, you, you know, it is the pattern. And the, if you ask them why are you doing this, well, we just do it. I mean, that's why you do it. That's what you, <laughs> that's how you do Scrum. I mean. You're not doing Scrum unless you use these points, um, and so people are not even not even asking themselves what job are we. They're not even having a conversation as a team what job they're hiring them to do. Um, the second thing is that the, um, I mean, I really do, a, I, I I do, and and I have found other ways to address this problem. I really do like the aspect of of working small, and I think that one of the challenges I see is that either you know, I, either people are so insistent on invest, like I in, invest as a sort of principle to make sure this thing is independently yeah. valuable, but, but they don't challenge themselves to work smaller, you know, work like I, I really would love to see a bunch of, um, you know, one to three hour stories, even if they don't hit all the checkpoints for invest, if, as long as I knew that they were part of something bigger. And so I think that I've noticed with teams is that the, that often the value that I had out of story points when I was using them was that it really inspired people to slice and work smaller and work as small as possible. And when people lose that, you get these, yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to just play Tetris with the sprint. You've got a couple big pieces and a couple small pieces and a couple other little pieces and you're doing it. And they're forgetting about that idea of working smaller. So our marketing team actually uses story points um, at Amplitude. And I'm always saying like, how can you work smaller? How can you work smaller, work smaller? That's not, you know, I don't care if that fits in a whole sprint, like how can you work smaller to think about it? And so I'd say that's the, the you know, there's many sort of anti-patterns to miss, but I think that one, the team's not even being aware whatsoever to even have a conversation about what job they're hiring them to do. That They think that that's something you have to do. And then the second thing is lo losing the perspective of how you can build that muscle to work smaller using points and, and that one job is the idea was the idea of decomposition and, and, and thinking about splitting. And I find that a lot of teams don't even really do that anymore that, you know, big is big and, and the small ones are small and they just deal with that. So um, I don't know. Those are two things that came to mind. Well, you teed up Andrew really nicely with a chime in for marketing. So Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to introduce me to your marketing team. Um, but yeah, the the idea of coming back to this theme of, of what jobs do the story points do, the, the anti-pattern that sprung to mind instantly when Kelly asked this was, I knew of a team, a marketing team, they were a, a really like a shared services team, they did marketing technology. And so all kinds of teams are asking them like, set up this tool for me, optimize this tool for me. They had all these incoming requests, but they also had their own ideas about this new tool. If we could only find time to, to investigate it, right. Could solve all of these issues or these need to be better integrated. But the, those stories never seem to make it to the top of the backlog because they had all of these things that were on fire instead. And so they started using Agile to try to deal with some of this and they got really good at accurately tracking. We can do a hundred points in a sprint, right? We're, we're can definitively say this is, this is a good estimate of our average velocity. And then they came to a sprint where they looked at all the, the things that everybody needed them to do. We must have you do these things in the next two weeks. And so that was like 130 points already before they even put any of their own ideas into the sprint. They said, oh good, we know, we definitively know we can't do that. It will not happen. Um, and so they took it, right? They come out of sprint planning and say, we've got all this stuff, it's too much. We know we can't do it, what should we take out? And the higher ups said, too bad, you still have to do everything. And a month later, none of those people work there anymore. Like they literally all left because they were like, you've 
you've told me this is what I'm supposed to do. And that this is the reason why we're using agile and the reason why we're going through all this rigmarole. And they were so let down by it. I was like, ouch, but right. That's, that's almost a great, you know, lesson in, in the power of, of the, the estimation and the points when they can show you these things and let you solve the problem instead of just, we're always so busy and nothing ever seems to get done. And we don't know why. That's a kind of a downer story. Sorry about that. Yeah. There was a silver lining. There was a silver lining. <laughs> yeah. They've all got better jobs, I assume. Yeah, sure. yeah. Absolutely. They've graduated. Yeah. <laughs> Troy, uh, we'll go Troy and then to Mike. Uh, Anti-patterns and, and way to, to kind of yeah, the, get back. I, I guess I'm going to take the other side of it, not the okay. size of the work. Um, yeah, and I know it sounds strange coming from me, but I think we use too much historical data uh, and without context, right? I mean, I see companies and teams pride themselves We've got, we, you know, our tool uses a hundred samples of historical data from my team back in 1970 that were coding in COBOL. <laughs> well, that's no longer relevant, right? So the only pattern I see is teams being reluctant to delete data that no longer makes sense when context changes or work changes or COVID happens, right? You think no matter how well you estimated your work on the um, what you wanted to do side, the rate that you're doing that work fundamentally changed in March, April, and May in the US and around the world, right? So we spent all this time estimating what work we think we're going to do and how big it is. And then we don't think about the system and environmental and business factors that are going to actually cause that work to be delivered at a slower rate, other things jumping the queue and so forth. So I think the anti-pattern is focusing on the work size and not focusing on the delivery rate. And I think that we got some room to improve our industry by helping people think about, huh, what could make us deliver slower next month than last month? A little bit more than, is that a three or five point story? Mike, what are your fixes to all these problems? <laughs> Wait, I thought I could just state some problems. Um, <laughs> that was our yeah, job. Go for it, problems. What? Yeah, let it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the first the first one I'll start with that is is to to join in with what Andrea was saying, which is management going to a team and saying, yeah, you've got data that says such and such, and not data from the disco era, but you have relevant data that says such and such, but I don't believe you do it anyway. And I do agree that that's one of the biggest problems. The there's kind of an easy to say fix to that. It's a bit of a hard fix to implement, but a fairly easy one to say, which is that. In a situation like that, we have a case where management and the development team or marketing team, whomever they are, but the producers are not being treated as equal partners. And management feels free to just walk in and say, do it by this date. This is actually one of the reasons why getting good at estimating story points or ideal days or whatever it is, is helpful. Um, if you think about a team that's never been right at estimating, I know, Andrea, that's not the team you were describing, but think about a team that's never been right about estimating and management says, I need 100 30 points and the team says we can't do it i don't blame management for not believing them they've never been good at estimating in the past right but if a team builds up a track record of being pretty good not great not awesome not perfect but pretty good you know they said four months it took five they said four it took three and a half they came in scotty schedule but they were reasonably good at estimating now when management says i need 130 points if management is good and I do believe most management is good. If management says we need 130 and the team says we can only give you 100, now we're equal partners. And now we can talk about how do we solve that problem? Do we drop a drop a feature. Maybe we're trying to support Internet Explorer 3, right? Let's drop support for IE3. All of a sudden, the schedule cuts in half. Maybe we're trying to come out in eight languages, right? Let's come out in five in the first version. Um, Year-end reports. No, it's an October release. We don't need the year-end reports. So whatever it is, we can negotiate and find a way to do it. But that only happens once a team has enough credibility to be treated as equal partners. Um, I'll wrap that up with just because I love this story. I worked with one product owner. I love what she did. Every email she sent the team in which she was asking for something, she ended the email with P.S., I also want a pony. And it was just her way of saying, I'm used to disappointment. I've been disappointed since I was a six-year-old girl. Um, if I can't get this, tell me the truth, right? And I just, I love that attitude from a, a product owner, product manager who's saying like, look, here's what I want. If I can't get it, let me know. We'll figure it out. That's... I think I might change my uh, email signature. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you guys shared uh, some good stories and some really good tips. Is there anything that we want to focus in on before we move on to really talking about best practices and estimation in the wild? We have about 15 minutes left. I guess I have a question for, for all folks too, is that um, when, when I think about, so, so I, I think there's a certain irony here that if, if a team wants to become more quote unquote predictable, at least in my mind, the path to doing that is figuring out how to work small, figuring out how to accelerate feedback loops, figuring out how to sort of sense their environment to what Troy is saying. But there's probably eight things I would put before giving something a point value. <laughs> if I wanted a team to really, really, really build the muscle of predictability, like I joked with a team that I worked with once that we're not gonna worry about story points. And the irony here is at the end of this, you're gonna be a lot better at being able to estimate what you're doing um, because of these things. And I was, I was wondering, how do, we, how do we add context to all the other things that teams can do to kind of build the muscle that's necessary for predictability outside of, I don't know, Troy, like what is predictability a function of? I'll toss it to you. Um, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it's very contextual. So what I find uh, the muscle I need people to build first and foremost is communication because there's, there's often, they're doing something that no one in the world has done and they're trying to give it the same accuracy as things that they've done a hundred times last week. They need to be able to express that, hell, no one's done this in the world yet. You know, this pony's looking doubtful, but um, you know, this um, turning around help desk tickets, resetting passwords, I do expect them to be accurate and I do expect them to use data and nail those estimates. So I think we need to get better at sort of, when Scotty sort of says that, you know, the hyperdrive is destroyed and we don't have, I don't even know what I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're going to, all, your, all the now. Star Trek fans have instantly. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've lost you. that whole demographic for Atlassian. I know. Well, sorry, Atlassian, a... you're going to have to go to someone else now. <laughs> yeah. But there's, there's, there are things which are possible and impossible. And at the moment they're, in, they're blended in our backlogs and we don't, if we could spend a little bit more time communicating which ones we know and which ones we don't so that it's clear which ones are risky, I think that muscle of being able to um, articulate uncertainty is the one I would want to grow I, first. I think what Mike said ultimately is that that communication, that collaboration, you know, and the discipline associated with that, you know, the most professional teams are incredibly disciplined. You know, they, they, they follow that discipline of, and you, so you trust, you start building this trust. You have these conversations they, they you say, well, that look, that's too big. We, we're not going to make that in the time frame you're looking. And then you have that conversation. So what can we do in that time frame? What can we drop? Can we drop IE3? No, we can't drop IE3 because the boss has it because he's never upgraded and would get fired. Oh, actually though, we can drop, you know, whatever, you know, the surprising things that come out of these conversations that all ultimately lead to better product, right? And better value that you're going to deliver. I think that discipline, that repeat, I, and yeah, maybe I'm a bit scrummy, but I like the structure of the two week or one with the cadence of the sprint, the inclusion that that creates, the conversations that it creates. And uh, I think that's the muscle, that routine, that structure, that collaboration. You start doing that. Yeah, I, I personally love right sizing, what you said, make it as small as possible may and hopefully very small and you can do that i love techniques like that but i also like retrospective and review and is this right did we end up delivering like half of something useful because we were so maniacal about making it small should if we'd have spent another three four days would it be better well actually yeah it would have been ah oh, well maybe we can you know fix that for next time it's those conversations, it's that discipline, it's that rigor, dare I say, which is, which is super important. And the honesty, like, I don't really know. We did something similar, it wasn't quite the same, that was this, but it could be this, and there's all this stuff, and there's an interface, and, you know, those honesty, I guess, right? 
The yeah, huge I challenge think- with that is bosses don't want to hear, I don't know, right? You know, and Troy was talking about the things we know and the things we don't and be able to say, I can't estimate this right now. I've never done anything like this. I did a whole um, keynote conference, a uh, keynote speech at a conference where the whole goal of the keynote was to get people about 40 minutes in to stand up and say, I don't know, um, because everybody feels like they know things and we don't, right? And um I might know that story points are a good thing, but that could change in two years. I learned something better or whatever it is. And it's to get rid of this certainty that people feel about things. But it's really hard to say, I don't know to a boss. That is a big challenge for a lot of folks. I don't blame them. It's tough. I, I guess it's the, uh, and it's the onus is on the boss, right? I know, you know, that that's my job. If, as I, if I'm the boss, I, I'm not totally sure I am ever, but <laughs> if I was, um, <laughs> uh, certainly not in this house, um, the, if I was, you know, I would have the conversation rather than asking for an estimate. I'd start talking about size. I'd talk about complexity. I'd, you know, I'd encourage them to have the conversation, I guess, because I don't know is really hard, particularly when you've got ego, position, promotion, all of that incentive tied to it. It is hard. But that's back to John just asking, are you looking at one to three weeks or one to three months or one to three decades, right? And that's or me great. saying hours, days, weeks, months, or years, right? I mean, you're telling a team, I'm not looking for a lot of precision. That's where a lot of it goes wrong is when teams feel like they have to be super precise, right? I don't need precision to know, to make a decision on something. I need something fairly accurate, but it doesn't have to be very precise. I think this is where like a services oriented group like marketing tends to get in trouble because we're often at the end of the line, right? Where a lot of things have already happened and we've got to line up very precisely to a product release date, a conference event. Like these things are happening on this date. And if we miss it by a day or two, it can be quite catastrophic. And so if if you're gonna force people to hit a date, then it's like you all are saying, the, the conversation has to happen of, okay, well then, if you can't give us everything by the conference start date, what comes out of the queue instead of just saying, no, you have to give us everything and you have to hit this deadline. And we kind of don't care what that does to your work-life balance. Yep. And I try and I try and encourage people to forecast the start date rather than the end date for that reason. If you, if this date, pa- if you pass this date, it's may not, no longer be viable to do. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's spinning it around and sort of saying, um, we're not going to forecast when it's going to finish. We're going to forecast when we need to start to give us a chance to get it is a powerful way to actually make sure that those cutting decisions are made earlier. Yeah. And that's the key, making them early, right? I mean, by, and so by doing that, starting at the back and working forward instead of starting at the front and working backwards, which I think I saw you present in a conference, the, um, it changes everything, changes everything. Yeah destabilizes your boss anyway, because it's a very different (laughs) conversation. So at least it resets the playing field. All right, everyone, we're going to move on to the last topic. We have about nine minutes left, and I know there's a lot to cover here. We've we've touched on um, some best practices, but I really want to focus on best practices for estimation in the wild. So whether you're a new team starting out or you're a mature team, what are some takeaways to really um, whether it's story points or alternatives or um, specific estimation models, like what are some takeaways for teams that listen to you all and things that they could really take and learn and implement um, and get value out of as a team? Um, I'll start with Mike. Um, well, I'll give you a couple just really quick um, suggestions for teams. One is, um, this is an old technique, but it, not enough teams know about this, triangulate your estimates. So when you're estimating an item, compare it to two others. Um, it comes from the old idea of sailing and you know, looking at the White House over there and the Rocky Point over there. And I cross-reference those, I can tell where I'm at. So if you've got something that you think is a five, the team's talking about being a five, compare it to maybe an eight and a three or something, just something bigger and smaller and say, is this in between those? Um, Another one is to, um, there's a technique called unpacking. There's been some research into this. Unpacking refers to taking something, I don't want to say huge, but moderate size, breaking it down, list the, the sub stories within it, but then don't estimate the sub stories, just identify them, then go back and estimate the bigger thing, the, the parent story, uh, parent backlog. And that's been shown to produce better estimates. Um, a big one for me that we've talked about is to estimate only when 
the estimate is going to help you uh, act or decide differently, right? If it's, if the estimate is just going to help you sleep better at night or help the boss sleep better at night, don't waste time on it, right? There's better things to do than estimate those things. So um, too many teams spend too much time estimating and it's it very quickly can turn into waste. It can be very helpful in decision-making, but very quickly can turn into waste. John, how about you? Yeah, I had three thoughts to this. I think it, this um, might relate to some of the things Troy has been talking about, but I think um, working with your team to co-design what I'd say like taxonomies of work, you know, really, so what I ask teams is like, what must we know about the work to be able to make good decisions about it? And then what do we know about it right now? And so what you find is, is you don't try to get a checklist that you must check off everything before you start the work. But what you start to understand is, and a fascinating thing here with designers is you could have whole swaths of your team that has very specialized knowledge about how it will respond differently depending on what it knows about the work that never really gets to voice that. So I think like building an internal, what I would call like a taxonomy for the work. And then at least that helps flag what Troy says when it falls out of a reference class, like something that we can do. So that would be one. Um, I think that the next thing is like calibrating on past efforts. I mean, that just, just, just looking at, if you, if you come up with a taxonomy of work and then review the last 15 of those things and what did we know about it at the time and what planned, at least you can calibrate your levels of uncertainty. So people start saying things like three to six months. I don't know. You know, that's, that's my guess at the moment. And I think that the final thing for me is I I'm obsessed with this like nesting of work. So the ability the ability to take those small things and make sure you're not losing sight of the bigger things that they're a part of. So what are the messy middle is the one to three quarter missions that no one really talks about in the say in the yearly planning. And then no one thinks about because they're not next week's work. But if you can, if you can really clarify the why in the one to three quarter range for those missions, then it, it helps you level set your decisions in the near term. Like, are we really thinking about the why here? What, what mission are we trying to accomplish to do that? So I, I would add those three, I think is helpful. Troy, how about you? Yeah, I, I think just promote a curiosity in the teams to reflect back on what was one surprising thing that really made this different than we anticipated it to be and reward that sort of curiosity. So just spend a little bit of time reflecting on what did we learn about doing this type of work and how much of that's in our future. And I think, um, you know, as a, as a boss, a manager, whatever, start provoking the conversation around when someone says, Oh, we did this and this went wrong. Say, cool. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Now, what are we going to do? To, do we have any more like that? You know, just start um, promoting those conversations of embracing learning why things went wrong and, and reflect, find out what went wrong and then just incrementally get a little bit better at it, but understand why. Yeah. That's, that's what I would like to do. Andrew, how about all those marketers out there? Hmm. Um, I would echo what Mike said. Um, I'm a big fan of kind of the reference story or, or that kind of practice of triangulation just to say, you know, here's something we do often and we understand well, that's a five, right? It takes, you know, a couple of days with a couple of people working on it. Let's call it a five. And then when you get something to estimate, is it bigger or smaller than that thing that we agreed is a five? And that I think helps build the muscle up for, you know, when people have never done this before and you're like, okay, so Fibonacci numbers, here we go. And they're like, I'm out. I have no idea what you're talking to me about. Um, is to just be able to say bigger or smaller than this. Okay, good. Let's start with that. Um, back in the day when we used to be in person with people, I loved like affinity estimation where people could move yeah, the stickies yeah. into columns and you don't talk and you can do that big volume of work really quickly and you avoid anchoring on somebody's, you know, opinion. Um, so getting, getting the muscle built up in a way that doesn't suck away a ton of time and energy from the team, uh, I think is crucial to getting people comfortable. Cause then we've, we've done it enough times to at least be able to, like Troy was saying, ask the intelligent questions about what went awry and what can we learn from it instead of just getting hung up around, okay, is it a two or a three, you know? 
Dave, last but not least. Yeah, yeah. I, gosh, bringing up the rear, as it were, because there's lots of all great points. Uh, I have to say, uh, I, I my one of my most enjoyable experience of estimation was with Mike Cohen's uh, planning poker tools. Uh, and, and so I, we, I got like 20 because somebody had left the conference and just left them. And I took them into the office and we, we used them massively for, for months. And it wasn't the, I hate to say this, it wasn't actually the thing. It was the conversations around the thing. But the thing was great as well, by the way, because they, they were awesome. And slowly they got more dog-eared and, and smell of thing, you know, Chinese food and pizza and stuff. So it was great. So I'd just like to say that. And um, I guess there's, there's a few things. One is macro level roadmap planning is very different to team level. I know you say this, Joy. I think that's super different, super different worlds. And the problem is when we try to do that, you know, following the sort of Kokomo model, remember Kokomo? Some of you are old enough. <laughs> that Kokomo model of bringing it all the together from bottom up and top down and we create this massively complicated thing. That's rubbish. Don't do that. So number one, don't do that. They're very different. Number two, continuous estimation, continuous, pl always be continuously looking and refining and improving. These things aren't, even if they're in Jira, they can change. And in <laughs> fact, they have a really good tool for changing them. It's even better. It's not like when you write them on a piece of paper and then you have to scribble them out, which is a disaster. You actually do have that in technology, which, which is awesome. Awesome. I, I think so continuous. And then, as you all just said over and over again, horses for courses, you know, use it, use it, use the right horse in the right course. This is not, I'm not sure what that analogy is, but the, but the <laughs> oh, metaphor is. So the, the bottom line is that we just, let's not overuse something in like 57 different contexts, just because we've got it, you know, everything isn't a nail, you know, and that, that's the bottom line. And, and it's not part of the religion of scrum. Uh, as, as much as, you know, it has become that, it is literally a technique for helping teams <laughs> decide what they're going to do next and helping product owners decide if something's worth doing, you know, and, and let's, just, let's just use it that way. It's all good. It is all good. Thank you. This was wonderful. We're at time. Sorry, I let us go a little long in the beginning. You guys are having a great conversation, but I appreciate all of you um, volunteering and being a part of this. This is really great. And I hope that if I reach out again, we might be able to continue the conversation.